Mais merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. Je suis très contente d'être ici. Et je vais quand même présenter aujourd'hui en anglais. J'espère que ça ne dérange personne. So I'll talk about moti metabolic modifications induced by hepatitis C virus and the implications in the pathogenesis and carcinogenesis, as well as um, current treatment. So hepatitis C virus is a flavivirus. And um, when it, um, in, in, in the context of chronic liver infection, it takes many, many years to develop liver cancer. And even though we know that some of the viral proteins in, in hepatocytes can actually in, in, uh, interact with um, cellular proteins that drive cell cycle control, proliferation. And even though we know that the virus does not genetically integrate, so we, and, um, so we think that even though that, um, even though, even though there's direct interactions with potential pro-oncogenes, we think that the transformation progress is probably indirect because it takes so many years. And we, there's actually indeed a lot of strong clinical data which show that um, um, chronic infection is associated with metabolic features such as steatosis, insulin, or insulin resistance. And these are in turn closely linked to mitochondrial dysfunctions. They cause oxidative stress and are linked to inflammatory processes. And we think that on the long term, these inflammatory processes will drive fibrosis. And then in the context of late fibrosis, cirrhosis, um, there's induction of liver cancer. Importantly, hepatitis C virus does not only affect the liver, it's also a systemic disease. And we think that metab systemic metabolic changes in inflammation actually drive um, or increase the risk for cardio um, cardiovascular disease, lymphoma, renal disorders, and other, and, other, um, and other clinical symptoms. So today, I will actually give you an overview of the HC-associated changes um, to host lipid and glucose metabolism in the liver. I will detail some mechanisms of induction, uh, discuss impact on the, or the consequential pathogenesis, and then um, quickly touch on um, the question whether these changes are reversible and how they actually, what role they play in treatment. So you all probably know that amongst the risk factors for fibrosis progression in chronic hepatitis C are not only gender, age, H HIV, HPV confections, alcohol consumption, immune status, but importantly also features of the metabolic syndrome viscero obesity, steatosis, diabetes, insulin resistance. And given the fact that metabolic syndrome is so um, frequent, there's about 40 to 50% of adults over 40 years are affected by metabolic syndrome. Uh, these um, meta well, uh, metabolic features play a really important underlying role in, in the pathology of chronic hepatitis C. So the life cycle of hepatitis C is really dependent on the hepatic lipid metabolism. Upon the entry of hepatitis C virus into a hepatocyte, the virus is taken up by clathrin-mediated endocytosis. The viral capsid um, releases the RNA, and then trans um, translation transcription starts at ER membranes. And we know that the virus actually needs to recruit lipid kinases, for example, phosphonidative 4 um, 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 phosphate um, kinase, in order to really change the lipid composition at the ER. And these, um, these changes allow it to actually form membrane vis vesicular structures at the R, and the virus really replicates within these structures. There's also lipid droplets, which are really in close association to these structures, and they probably form the platform for viral assembly, and are really important um, for, 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 for replication assembly. So assembled particles are then um, secreted and released by, um, by exosomes. And importantly, in patients, in of patients, the virus can be detected in two forms, either as a canonical virus or in association with lipoproteins. And this association with lipoproteins is important. It wants to augments the specific infectivity of the virus. And, um, and indeed, several of the HC receptors are either lipoprotein receptors or involved in lipid transfer. So last year, some really elegant work by Christoph Meunier's lab at Tour showed that actually, for the first time, the structure of these lipo, lipo, um, lipoprotein-associated particles or lipoviral particles. 
And in contrast to a canonical virus, which contains the RNA uh, uh, encapsulated within the viral capsid, a double uh, membrane layer, and the glycoproteins, the liboviral particle, uh, the, 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 the viral capsid, probably with just one um, envelope monolayer, is really integrated into the center of lipoprotein particles, which consist of cholesterol esters and glycoprotein, uh, triglycerides. And at the surface of these lipoviral particles, you'll find the upper lipoproteins. And um, there's also, and uh, Christoph Mirenier's group showed that by EM, these glycoproteins, envelope glycoproteins within these structures. Now, these lipoviral particles, in contrast to canonical virus, are highly infectious. And they're also protected from neutralizing antibody responses. So probably this, this, the formation of lipoviral particles is really important, increases viral fitness overall. Now, in order to produce these lipoviral particles, HC hijacks the VLDL pathway. In a hepatocyte, the um, triglyceride, which, um, which is produced, is being um, stocked in um, in, in either within the, the ER membrane leaflet or in the form of lipid droplets, which are associated with the ER membrane. And in order to secrete triglycerides, the, um, the mitochondrial um, triglyceride transfer protein at the ER membrane will actually transfer triglycerides into a nascent or hydrophobic pocket of nascent APOB100 protein. And once this hydrophobic pocket becomes big enough, the particle actually butts off into the ER lumen and the maturation of the, and secretion of the VDL, du during maturation and secretion, the association with other upper proteins like APOE is really important. Now HCV forms membranous web structures within the ER, these vesicles, double membrane vesicles with which the virus replicates. And the core protein of the virus is actually usually in close vicinity on the surface of lipid droplets. And we don't actually understand fully how it, how it works. Probably core protein um, recruits the, the, the um, RNA into the, into the forming vesicle, and the vesicle then somehow integrates into the center of these apolipoproteins apolipopro to form these lipoviral particles. Now, the fact that HCV actually hijacks VLD pathways has important um, consequences on the VLD, uh, on, on triglyceride and lipid uh, metabolism in infected cells. So I've already talked about local enrichment of PIP4 uh, at the membrane. The virus is also known to interact and actually uh, induce um, DGAT, which is a, a rate-limiting enzyme of triglyceride synthesis, and it also requires the cell effectors TIP47, RAP18, um, which usually uh, mediate the transfer of triglycerides onto lipid droplets. The, um, the furthermore, apolipoproteins, in particular apolipoprotein E probably, is really important for the maturation of the, of the lipoviral particles and determines also uh, secretion and, and high specific infectivity. Now importantly, the insulin resistant state, which has been um, associated or has been, has been known to be associated with SHG, uh, HCV infection, favors um, the stabilization of ApoB100 Apo um, and it also augments the transcription of um, MTP. However, we know that on the long term, in infected cells, MTP transcript levels go down, and they actually correlate inversely with steatosis levels in patients. Now, in addition to, to modifying transcript levels of MTP, HCV can induce steatosis also by other mechanisms. We know that the virus can actually directly, or core protein, can actually directly activate uh, uh, enzymes of glycolysis, and that will um, ensure sufficient precursors for lipogenesis. And I'll get, I'll get back to that later. The virus has also been shown to inhibit PPA alpha transcription. PPA alpha is a master transcription later of, of lipid import and beta oxidation. So the effect of that will also be lipid accumulation. The virus has been shown to activate the SHREP1 uh, C and two, uh, two transcription factors which drive lipogenesis as well as cholesterol synthesis. And that's so either via direct interactions or via inflammation, via um, EKK alpha activation. 
And finally, in, in genotype 3, the virus has been shown to downregulate P10, and that by insulin signaling can also favor lipogenesis. Favor lipogenesis. Now, the first, um, the first uh, analysis or the first studies which really shed some light on the metabolic fluxes in HCV-infected cells was a proteome study by the Katz Laboratory. And they used HCV-infected HUH7 cells, or they actually infected them with HCVCC, or with UV inactivated virus. And then they harvested cells um, one, two, or three days post-infection and did um, a proteome analysis. So they showed a, a strong interaction of glycolysis in infected cells. And this um, induction was actually act, uh, was associated with lactate production. And that means that glycolysis is uncoupled from the TCA cycle in infected cells. The, so as a consequence, the glycolytic, glycolytic intermediates accumulate and they're available for nucleotide, uh, reduction equivalent production and lipid synthesis and, and other biosynthetic processes, which probably required for, for virion um, production. As, as you can see here. The, um, to compensate for the loss of pyruvate for the use in the TCA cycle, the HCV-infected cells were shown to induce glutamine lysis, which you can see here, which also ensured um, active oxfos, um, oxidative phosphorylation in infected cells. You can see that most of the complexes are, are, are strongly um, induced. The, um, and so, most, some of these data, they actually also validated in HTV patient biopsies. Now, um, they also performed in parallel um, a lipidomic study, and they showed that um, um, DS, uh, triacyl glycerols as well as costal um, esters were actually reduced in infected cells. And that correlated with virin association, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the amount of variance in, in, in these cells. And surprisingly, they also observed an induction, uh, an, an increase of beta oxidation, and that suggests that concomitant um, lipid synthesis and turnover took place in infected cells. Finally, they also discovered that um, there was an increase in um, sphingomyelin and ceramides in infected cells, and that may have potential implications for, um, um, for the pathogenesis. The ceramides are known to uh, be pro-apoptotic and, 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 and induce lipotoxicity. And in that sense, it's probably not surprising um, that um, there, were, there was a strong induction of NRF2 NRF stress responses in infected cells. So in terms of glycolysis, it was shown by several groups that um, the virus induces glucose uptake and lactate production in vitro. And it does so by directly inducing and, uh, and, and binding to two major, to, to, to rate-limiting enzymes of glycolysis, hexokinase 2 and uh, pyruvate kinase M2. It's also been shown that the virus induces major glycolytic transcription factors, CMIC, HIF1-alpha, for example, and it induces pyruvate dehydro dehydrogenase kinase, which activates the pyruvate dehydro dehydrogenase complex. And this complex is actually important for the, the transport of pyruvate into mitochondria for, t for use in the TCA cycle. So that means, um, and that again confirm that um, pyruvate transfer is blocked and that um, it's actually, um, pyruvate is, is, is uh, converted into lactate. And importantly, lactate accumulation in the microenvironment may have important um, profibrogenic pro effects on hepatic stellate cells. The, um, so, and that meant this, uh, the, the induction of glycolysis and a coupling from the TCA cycle resembles, importantly, that um, a Warburg effect, which is frequently observed in cancer cells. So the induction of glycolysis uh, was, conf uh, was here confirmed in biopsies. You can see that MIC, HIF, as well as PDK isoforms are strongly induced here in HCV-positive biopsies compared to um, control biopsies. The McKeating Laboratory is also, um, has studied in more detail the role of HIF1-alpha in HCV infection. So they showed that actually HCV infections require HIF1-alpha. If, if you inhibit it, you block, you block replication levels. HIF1 is induced usually by oxidative stress, but may also be induced directly by the virus. 
And importantly, um, the, labor uh, HIF, uh, the McKeating laboratory showed that HIF-1 induction is associated with a depolarization of hepatocytes because it can induce EMT, uh, EMT markers, such as SNAIL, for example. And the other important consequence of HIF-1 if HIF-1 alpha stabilization is obviously um, the induction of, of poor angiogenic signaling via VEGF as well as um, TGF-beta signaling. So the first real um, metabolomic, st or the, real, the first study which really sort of quantified metabolites in HCV infection came from, the, from an is Israeli uh, laboratory. They used HCV infected um, um, co-cultures. They used uh, primary human hepatocytes in co-culture with liver sinusoidal and the cilia cells, which overexpress um, the, the lectin receptor l sign, and that under highly oxygenated conditions. So they quantified 31 metabolites at um, steady state levels, and that allowed them to actually um, calculate metabolic fluxes. And again, they, um, they, um, they saw an induction of glycolysis. This induction was dependent on H and F4 alpha. And glycolysis was coupled to lactate production. They saw actually that the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation were slightly shut down. Now, importantly, um, HNF4-alpha is a, transcription, a glycolytic transcription factor which can actually complement HIF1-alpha. So that made a lot of sense. The, um, they also, um, um, when looking at lipid metabolites, um, surprisingly, say, they saw that, um, that uh, they saw an induction of beta oxidation, which was PPA-alpha dependent. And they saw a, a repression of cholesterol biosynthesis, which was FXR, FXR dependent. And the, 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 um, they, are, they furthermore showed that using um, PPAR inhibitors, um, that, um, well, in, in the context of PPAR inhibited cells, um, the uh, replication levels of HCV are increased. Now, these data are somehow contradictory to data obtained by other laboratories where it was shown that um, HCV actually decreases beta oxidation in the sense of the induction of acetatosis. So, in, um, in cohort studies, um, it's been shown that um, HCV positive, in HCV positive uh, biopsies, PPR alpha mRNA levels as well as um, CPT1, one of the major targets of um, PPR alpha, are strongly, are strongly decreased. And importantly, the transcript levels of these two factors correlate inversely with steatosis. And mechanistically, uh, the, in the, the decrease of PPR alpha has been, um, has been shown, uh, um, been induced by core protein. Furthermore, the um, um, it's well known in the field that HCV replication really depends on cholesterol synthesis. It's very sensitive to the inhibition of HNG-CoA reductase inhibitors. And one of the reasons for that dependence on cholesterol um, metabolism is the fact that um, uh, the, uh, the membrane recruitment, recruitment of the non-structural protein NS5A of the virus depends on granul granulation of, of, of cellular factors. So um, our group has um, also shown that the virus strongly depends on glutaminolysis. We have shown that the virus really increases glutamine uptake and use in the, uh, in the uh, TCA cycle and for oxidative phosphorylation. We measured, for example, oxygen, co oxygen consumption in infected cells, which you can see here. So in comparison to uninfected cells, you can see that the basal oxygen consumption in infected, here three-day infected and long-term infected cultures is significantly, significant, significantly increased. And is really linked to ATP production because if we use oligomycin, an ATPase inhibitor, you know, we can really, uh, we can drop, we, we can reduce uh, oxygen consumption to baseline. Glutamine also plays an important role as, as nitrogen donor in HCV infection. We have shown that it is important for import of other amino acids, amino acid conversions, and it's also important as a, as a precursor for glutathione and um, therefore plays an important role in the redox balance of infected cells. 
We have further shown that the virus actually really depends on glutamine lysis. If we use an um, inhibitor of glutaminase, the rate-limiting enzyme of glutamine lysis, we can inhibit HC replication in a dose-dependent fashion. And finally, um, have we been able to show um, in liver biopsies that um, the virus specifically induces um, um, transcripts of glutaminase uh, isoforms as well as glutamine transporters? So to summarize these metabolic changes induced by HCV, they probably resemble really closely that to that of, of cancer cells in that the virus induces glycolysis quite strongly, um, but it blocks the transfer of, of, of pyruvate into the TCA cycle. And that allows it to use glycolytic, glycolytic intermediates for really for biosynthetic pur purposes, production of lipids, nucleotides, and uh, NADPH as well as ATP. The infected cells also really depend on glutamine in order to compensate and drive the TCA cycle, energy production, but also as a nitrogen donor for redox balance as well as amino acid metabolism. And probably both glutamine lysis and glycolysis actually then feed, um, uh, produce the precursors for lipid and cholesterol metabolism. Now importantly, some of the key enzymes, or some of the metabolic key enzymes that are required for HCV infection, such as glutaminase, um, pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, a liver pyruvate kinase, or, or, or um, HCM coal reductase, are currently um, key targets um, for HCC treatment. Now, as I've already um, indicated on previous slides, the changes to the central car carbon metabolism um, have probably strong prophibrogenic um, effects. So the accumulation of lipid in, within the cell steatosis is linked to lipid uh, is, is, is linked to oxidative stress, and lipid oxidative stress in the, in the context of a rich lipid environment will um, favor lipid oxidation. Lipid oxidation is a radical um, a radical reaction which can actually amplify. And we know, for example, in the case of HCV, that HCV is highly sensitive to lipid oxidation. So HC you can use a whole battery of, of rust scavengers in order to prevent that. But in the long term, there's accumulation of lipid peroxides. And lipid peroxides can actually lead to, um, to insulin resistance. They will induce cytokine signaling. And um, we also know that um, the induction of glycolysis, HIF1 alpha, so on, it can induce angiogenesis, GGF beta, and the list goes on. So metabolic changes are really pro-fibrogenic. So on my last slide, I would just like to, uh, to um, um, mention briefly how um, HCV-induced metabolic changes may, um, how they're important for, for, for treatment. So in, com in contrast to previous um, therapies, which uh, or interferon-based therapies, where it was clear that metabolic um, syndrome, particularly insulin resistance, um, 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 were were, were negative factors for to obtain um, an SVR. I, um, with the current DA treatments, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Um, current treatments, basically all patient populations over, over well over 90-95, well close to 100% of um, SVRs can be obtained, and really the only um, patient population which remains different, difficult to treat are cirrhotics. The um, now, are HCV-mediated metabolic changes reversible um, upon um, sustained viral response? We have shown, for example, that the induction of key glutaminolytic genes is reversible in vitro, but also um, in vivo. We've used uh, um, biopsies of patients um, treated with interferon ribavirin, and uh, transcript levels of key glutaminolytic genes went back to baseline. We also, there's now also data coming out which clearly show that insulin resistance normalizes in, in, in patients treated, successfully treated with DAA, and that the risk to develop diabetes drops. However, there's um, some recent papers which suggest that in patients with very mild fibrosis and who had an abnormal glucose homeostasis before treatment, the, the risk of HCC remains well, it, it, it goes down, but it remains, in, in, in contrast to other patients, slightly elevated. So that means that there is an implication for insulin resistance, probably, which is pro-carcinogenity. 
poor carcinogenic. The DAA treatment, current DDA treatments are also reverse steatosis and fibrosis levels, as well as extrahepatic symptoms in SVR. And, um, but one of, the, uh, one of the issues which is emerging here is that um, upon um, viral clearance in these patients, there's an increase in total uh, and LDL cholesterol as well as oxidized LDL cholesterol. And, that, um, and there's a debate on whether that um, puts these patients um, at risk of cardiovascular diseases. And in that case, um, there's a current um, discussion whether statin um, treatment may be, um, may be applicable. So to conclude, um, the combination, um, there is a, um, there's a still need um, for combination treatment of current DAAs, DAAs with metabolic inhibitors, um, particular for these um, um, high-risk patients. And further exploration of the metabolic changes induced by HCV, I think, will be really important to further uh, um, identify the pro-fibrogenic and pro-carcinogenic um, um, properties. And with that, um, I would like to thank um, the um, members of my team. Um, the work on gluten lysis has mainly been done by Pierre Levitch and Eva Moll in the laboratory. And I would like to thank all the other people at the SCRCL, as well as my collaborators and, and funding, funding uh, grants. Thanks very much.